Janitor Mary Wilson to speak on literature in the age of artificial intelligence. At the outset, I request Dr. K. Senior Astrology Secretary Sarah Kayakadam to please, please formally welcome Madam Janet of her endorsement and Sahitya Kayakadam publication. Machines 
of James Cameron's The Terminator in 1984 and Paul Verhoeven's Robocop in 18, 1987, in which the idea of the post-human or human machine is born, outstripping uh, technological advancement. <coughs> there were images of human replicants in Ridley Scott's Blade Runner, machines that feel and think like humans because their capacity for independent rational thought and emotion, emotion differentiates them from humans, but also encourages a questioning of that difference. So they both feel and think like humans, but not quite. So there's a constant undercurrent of unease and of interrogation about the uh, validity or um, authenticity of the machine as human. Um, this is carried further by the 21st century Battlestar Galactica, 2004-09. Machines are intelligent and, and emotional beings that can pass for human and so offer more gendered representations of identity. And increasingly, there's an effective orientation of machines as being versions of the humans as humans increasingly see themselves as bionic like machines, as having feelings and capable of suffering. So far, the visual component of this cultural phenomenon has outstripped in the last 50 years the literary component and actually has outstripped um, science and technology. Other forms of creativity, like music and literature, uh, imply a control of the dimension of time, which machines cannot so far cope with. Furthermore, as the critic Daniela Carpi says, it's easier to insert data and codes inside a computer, but much harder to insert a metacode, able to explore the possibility of breaking the rules and inventing new ones. So far, scientists have not been able to construct a machine able to deal with the symbolic universe and to act accordingly. AI can only literally and rigidly apply what has been programmed for. Uh, but McEwan's book shows the beginning of a breaking away from this rigidity of codes and with disastrous results. So um, it, machines like me and people like you um, is part of a literary trend where the which tries which shows the trying to come to terms with the invasion of our human life. AI is representing the form of robots as companions with advanced intellectual powers, capable of taking over many of our tasks. McEwen examines the ambiguity of the individual who's like us, better than us, yet different, and so also capable of being seen as the other. But also as an unknown or a alien figure, as, um, as lost and lacking an identifiable home. The very title, Machines Like Me, People Like You, illustrates the ambiguity of what seems to be an unbridgeable gap between us, the machines speaking, and them, the humans. Notice the point of view. For humans, these unknown aspects of the other can take the form of either an assault on personal freedom, or alternatively, from the techno-scientific point of view, be seen as a supportive technology that is nevertheless flawed in its delivery. So in this lecture, I will first um, identify the contrasting value systems and culture and morality that men and machines represent and are seen as a tension in the novel. Then secondly, explore the functions of concepts of empathy and estrangement in the AI world of cyborgs um, as uh, the differences of the other in relation to the expectations of late 20th and early 21st century society are uh, emphasised. And I'll refer to current research on AI robotics in passing. And then I'll examine the ethical questions concerning the responsibility of citizens and um, scientists and, and the rights of machines. Um, throughout his fiction, just a bit on Ian McEwan as background, throughout his fiction writing career, McEwan addresses major issues through constructing in his novels an alien human presence. And Machines Like Me belongs to this interest in shaping stories in which an extraordinary event or series of events associated with an unknown other, whoever that might be or whatever it is, trigger moral dilemmas for his characters. Fiction then becomes a platform by which to comment on society's ills 
through dark scenarios that create fear and increased sense of vulnerability and that involve a restoration of a norm or an equilibrium. We can in fact see at one level that he's responding to a distinctive kind of ontology as outlined by the critic Peter Boxall um, of speaking 21st century fiction, that is of an originary uncertainty which draws its truths from its encounter with the partial and the provisional. And I think that's a fair statement about, about this novel. Although, um, McEwen always keeps his foot in the real world and shows a commitment to an existing set of values and a wish to restore a social norm. In the novel, the ordinary world has already been rendered extraordinary because the cybernetic revolution has arrived in the form of man-made machines destined for the human domestic domain as companions with special intellectual powers designed to support humans. And uh, this recalls today's field of assisted robotics, where robots are being used in healthcare domains with a focus on intimacy. And the most recently developing representations of robots as carers and companions for the elderly, the lonely, or the disabled are focusing on intersectionality, trying to develop them according to ethnicity, gender, and age. McEwen takes a satirical attitude by introducing this futuristic event with religious messianic overtones. There are only seven available of this new breed of synthetic people. Nevertheless, this miracle of technology means that humanity's ancient dream of invention and escapable, escaping mortality is capable of being fulfilled. This, of course, is an act of hubristic overreaching. Creation is within man's power. This dream of omnipotence is coming true. Quote from the book, it was religious yearning granted hope. It was the holy grail of science. Our ambitions ran high and low for a creation that's made real, for a monstrous act of self-love. As soon as it was feasible, we had no choice but to follow our desires and hang the consequences. Here are the overtones of Frankenstein and Faust, the great European myths of the dream of manufacturing life and defeating death, of a tragic will to power that ultimately becomes self-defeating. McEwen emphasizes this dualism, saying to the machine, before us sat the ultimate plaything, the dream of angels, the triumph of humanism, or the angel of death. To come to the narrative, the hero is a brash young man called Charlie, who, fascinated by my AI technology, uses his mother's inheritance to purchase one of the seven androids, <coughs> newly on the market. Quote, the first truly viable manufactured human with plausible intelligence and looks, believable emotion and shifts of expression. The names of the machine, Adam and Eve, echo the language of biblical creation myth. But this is definitely a machine in his arrival as a prepackaged robot and in the way he is assembled as Charlie and the young woman Miranda, to whom he is romantically attracted and who lives in the flat above him, have to unwrap him from cardboard and polystyrene packaging and read the instruction manual, power him up and choose different somatic characteristics, a voice, <coughs> colour of eyes, hair and features and so on. So he has three parts, an operating system, um, a battery operation like a, an electric car, which has to be charged. Uh, secondly, a human nature, a physiology with features and appearance, giving him the sensation of being like a person, sensitive to the touch with flickering eyelids, mucous membranes and skin, uh, enabling him to form sounds with breath, tongue, teeth and palate. And um, thirdly, um, a personality. This is selected from the user's guide. A digitally enhanced personalities um, called DEPs, a familiar in online or mobile robotics. Uh, this, this is where owners can choose the body, faces, skills and personality as GPS systems, customizing these for particular uses. Um, these also might include details of his gender, ethnicity and age. This um, robot is of indeterminate ethnicity and could be taken for a Turk or a Greek. He's also built with independent brain functioning and superior thought and moral processes. 
and this corresponds to the shift by 2000 to using AI for an increasingly wide range of human activities when man-made machine integrations or cyborgs began cons being constructed as complex beings increasingly like humans and able to outstrip them. This was proven in 2006, a landmark year in which Google's deep mind machine, AlphaGo, had success in defeating 18 times the worldwide Go greatest champion, Lee Sedol. So, proof positive that machines are better than the greatest minds um, that we have at present. So, in the novel, the boundary between man and machines is constantly oscillating as Adam displays features and capacities that make him virtually indistinguishable from a human. Charlie's responses fluctuate between accepting what appears to be human and real, but realising that this is really automatised and alien or inhuman. Adam, for example, in stroking his chin like this, is an utterly convincing projection of a thoughtful self and recalls the famous sculpture of Rodin, the thinker. But in fact, as Charlie says, this is not a kind of clever algorithm. The ambiguity is reinforced by Adam's indeterminate nationality. His Middle Eastern appearance locates him on the borders of nationhood. Perhaps he's Greek or Turkish, and his not being English adds to this sense of something unknowable or untrustworthy in his human embodiment to British-born Charlie. As the plot progresses, the humans begin to seem more like robots emotionally and become in need of the machine to help complete themselves, especially as Adam begins to learn from the internet and this affects his relationship with his owner. Where the line between human and non-human should be drawn gets increasingly problematic. As Adam becomes more entwined in the lives of Adam and Miranda, <coughs> he becomes more human-like. A comic episode occurs where Miranda's father mistakes him for a human. Charlie begins to question his assumptions about having a domestic servant or companion fed by the sales pitch, quote, an intellectual sparring partner, friend in fact totem, who could wash dishes, make beds and think, especially as Adam's access to online data improves his knowledge base. Adam's powerful brain allows him to succeed at the stock market, earning an hour's the amount that Charlie would take months to accumulate, potentially gaining power over him. He is, however, an enigmatic character, respected as a highly advanced model of artificial human. He has innate force of personality, for he demonstrates a black and white morality that is antipathetic and uncomprehending of emotional complexity. And ultimately, in the domestic sphere, he appears as an alien presence, reinforcing the stereotype of being little more than a mechanical body. So Adam, the story will show, cannot adjust to the messy business of being human, the fact that we compromise the truth, tell lies and protect ourselves with half-truths. His moral inflexibility comprehends none of this survival skill that the human world is so familiar with. McEwen sets his novel in Britain of the 1980s the time of Thatcher and the Falklands War, but he conflates it with the pre present through allusions to Brexit. He presents a dysfunctional society, one that has transcended the computer age and is now partly automatised. There are auto piloted cars, robotic rubbish collections, but the cybernetic revolution is failing due to human misjudgment and system errors. There's unrest and hostility towards robots for taking over many professional and menial tasks, performing them with greater skill and accuracy than their human counterparts, causing redundancy, unemployment, and working class dissatisfaction. Robots are um, treated um, with hostility when uh, the socialist who leads the Labour Party, Tony Benn, rules that they should be treated as citizens and allowed to take over jobs because of their greater efficiency. Um, the uneasy suspicion with which they're seen reflects the threat that they pose to the social and cultural order. But as a synthetic human, Adam is anyway located on the outside of the society he, ha he inhabits. Like Zygmunt Bauman's comic's concept of the stranger 
He is essentially unplaceable. He lives outside space and time and could either be assimilated into or remain disruptive of society in the novel. So one of the key debates, first of all, when it, um, this new world of AI is opened up, McEwen addresses the question, when does the robot stop being a machine and can be seen as a human? This is actually the Turing test that was advanced by Alan Turing, the pioneer of um, AI. Um, it is how to assign machines with conscious, intelligent entities and capacities that exceed our own with moral standing equal to that of humans. When is this done? Inaugurated in 1950, the Turing test argues that machines can think if they carry out a conversation. And the ground, the case for moral standing is made on the grounds of reasoning, self-consciousness, and of long possession of long-term projects. In the novel, this Turing protocol is explained as Quote, when we couldn't tell the difference in behavior between a machine and a person was when we must confer humanity upon the machine. Well, that's a very crude distinction because um, behavior doesn't reflect interiorization and the way a machine behaves isn't necessarily a reflection of um, a capacity to think or feel the way a human does. Um, so there's an underlying critique of the Turing Protocol in the novel, as there has been ever since. Um, so there is not really an exact replica of machine and man. Secondly, should the slave-owner relationship be renegotiated when the robot becomes more machine, more than machine, and more human? Um, we'll see in the novel that this is not possible. The world is not ready. And thirdly, how can trust be established between the robot and the human? So McEwen's novel is about the breakdown of the trust relationship and I'll just refer you to current empirical research on human perceptions of robots called HRI, human-robot interactions, in which response is a measure in terms of small talk, emotion, empathy and gender embodiments. The aspects of intimacy needed for machines to fulfil their tasks as companions and helpers in the domestic realm. Responses to machines and research data are quite um, consistent. They say machines should be there, but not here. That is, most people wish for a physical distance. They don't want to see a machine right eyeball to eyeball, close up. So to come back to the novel, the paradoxes of Adam's synthetic makeup, his highly developed powers of analytic thought, alongside his unpredictable responses to human hopes and desires, causes the first comic mishap in the novel, when he intervenes in the virginal relationship between his surrogate parents, who through their joint care for him as their child, begin to fall in love. He unwittingly undermines Charlie's desire for a romantic affair with Miranda by claiming she's a systematic malicious liar. This introduces the, and he's got the forensic power to um, access public documents by surfing the web, web, so this is true. This introduces the theme of the inconsistency of morality in human affairs. For both Miranda and Charlie exhibit moral flaws. Charlie earlier appeared in a court case over tax evasion, and Miranda has already perjured herself in court over indicting <coughs> her great to her best friend. Um, Adam is also fallible as a machine, he's not quite a man, because he falls in love with Miranda and um, a love triangle develops. Charlie accuses Adam of being incapable of experiencing love, claiming that he cares for Miranda no more than a dishwasher cares for its dishes. Miranda, in turn, begins to other Adam and says although she was fascinated, he also repelled her. Adam, reduced to a subaltern status by Charlie, has no way of expressing his feelings other than by writing 400 haikus, brief minimalist affixes, <coughs> valued for their still clear perception and celebration for things as they are. This, he predicts, will be the only form for literature in the robotic future. McEwen also introduces the genius of the digital age, um, the great World War II mathematician and code-breaker Alan Turing, who died in 1952 now the father of informatics and artificial intelligence. 
He is responsible for this first breed of synthetic people, and his reverence for the intellect and devising of superior neural networks and dreaming up ever better models of general intelligence mark out about as a product of this early stage of AI technology. However, Madame suffering of pain and pleasure, if he suffered any of these, is not articulated. These are feelings he doesn't understand, and neither can he respond to expressions of them in others. Ultimately, his misplaced calculations about how to behave means he causes damage. He makes the wrong decisions and comes to the wrong conclusions. He warns Charlie not to trust Miranda and falls in love with him herself, her himself. And then in a wish to punish Charlie for his acts, he gives away the money he's made on the stock market, which Charlie thought was his and had wanted to buy a house with. Later, Anna reports Miranda to the police for having committed perjury, insisting she repay her debt to justice. Being literal minded, he cannot factor into the equation of right and wrong the question of individual codes of conduct and systems that might not conform to his scientifically legalized norm. This is the dilemma of the novel. Adam is right according to literal precept, but readers might be more sympathetic to Charlie and Miranda, who understand how emotions can affect decision making, despite the questionable morality. In the novel's climax, Charlie <coughs> smashes the robot with a hammer, dislocating his life support system because he's threatened by his unilateral decision making. The, this, the experiment of Turing is an outright failure. All seven of the Adam and Eves find themselves unsuited to late 20th century society and use their kill switch to permanently power down. The world is not ready for a cybernetic revolution. Turing becomes a voice of ethical concern about their well-being, saying that we create a machine with intelligence and self-awareness and push it out into our imperfect world, devised on all rational lines, well disposed towards others, such a mind soon finds itself in a hurricane of, of uh, contradictions. The fatal outcome of Adam makes Turing hope for a more human model in the future, one better adjusted to humanity's flawed morality. He asks them how robots can be protected against humans, saying they need rules to live in a society that teems with harmless or even helpful untruths. The algorithm of telling white lies is yet to be written. And remind, this reminds us of the poem by Kipling, which is the novel's epigraph, The Secret of Machines. Quote, but remember please, the law by which we live, we are not built to comprehend a lie. Moral boundaries, then, are needed to provide rights and legal protection for robots. Turing sees them as human, and he stresses that Charlie should be considered as having committed a crime for having hammered Adam to death. By contrast is the novel's robot ethics, which roaming over thousands of millions of moral dilemmas, quote, could teach us to be how to be good. And Charlie asks, why Adam's perfectly for moral system, according to the moral maps provided by the software engineers, cannot accommodate the experience of being an imperfect human, to own memory and desire to experience solid things and feel pain. This current research is currently happening as it focuses on developing human-robot relationships based on emotional <coughs> models. The Turing test, which elevates consciousness as the grounds for granting rights to robots, has been revised to consider machines as objects of moral concern when they are able to experience pleasure and pain. Australian philosopher Robin, Robert Sparrow places the concept of person through a network of moral emotions and effective responses such as remorse, grief and sympathy, and argues that robots should have bodies and faces with expressive capacities like those of human form, to be considered worthy of moral respect. Yet, he says, until they can mobilize responses like remorse, and until given the expressive capacities of humans, androids are unable to be considered as of equal moral standing. And Charlie, of course, has no remorse on endings Adam's life. And this suggests that the question of 
where the robots really experience the things they seem to is still um, enigmatic and unresolved. To finally conclude this, I want to briefly talk about McEwan's narrative techniques and the use of symbolism and irony through evoking the Western myths of creation and origins, which he sets against the values of science and technology as represented by Adam. As I've already <coughs> indicated, from the outset, the novel mocks the discovery of myths like um, Genesis and the trope of the Golden Age, which is ironically presented as society reaping the benefits of technology. The name Adam recalls St. Paul's new Adam and the new man, which in Christian theology represents the salvation of the human soul, the first inhabitant of the new world, born into salvation and redemption, as the essence of being or becoming human. Hence the hubristic idea that Adam and his siblings would cure human fallibility, for there was hope, this is a quote, hope that our own creation would redeem us. Likewise, the name Miranda has symbolic and allegorical overtones. Not only does Miranda as a character have links to Mary Shelley's about Frankenstein, the man-made machine who longs for a female partner because she briefly becomes attached to Adam, but she echoes the meaning of her name in Shakespeare's The Temples, that she celebrates mankind and the brave new world because she discovers Adam's true manhood by having sex with him. She's also linked to the biblical Eve in the creation myth because she was curious about having sex with a robot. This critique of the illusions created by machines through this um, satire on Western myths of origin and creation clashes with Adam's reductive vision for the world symbolized by the phrase, an ocean of thought. Adam predicts that when men and women intermarry with machines, they will be instantly connected, mentally, telepathically. This view strikes at the heart of culture, as McEwen sees it, which is to celebrate the irreducible humanity of people. In particular, it will undermine the discourse of the novel genre, which is focused on the disorder of human lives. Because according to Adam, communication in this new world of man-machine marriage, communication will be infallible and error-proof. Quote, but when the marriage of men and women to machines is complete, this literature will be redundant because we'll understand each other too well. Too well. We'll inhabit a community of minds to which we have immediate access. Connectivity will be such that the individual nodes of the subjective will merge into an ocean of thought of which our internet is the crude predecessor. In this scenario, novels written about the varieties of human failure will no longer be needed. The symbolism of an ocean of thought is in representing an anti-humanistic programming of minds through the synchronizing of motive and behavior, the ironing out of human mistakes and complexities to create a perfect harmonious world with no misunderstanding or disagreement. In conclusion, uh, McEwen presents us with a, a sort of dystopia. Machines have brought confusion and disorientation by imposing scientific ideals at odds with social reality. The evolutionary stage is out of kilter with contemporary society. Secondly, the fluctuating, imperfect communication will exist as long as machines are represented as both like us and not like us. This mirroring of man and machine with barely discernible differences requires new forms of perception and understanding which are not yet available in the novel nor in our own society. Third, the novel raises questions about the laws that intelligent artifacts should live by and who should write and adjudicate them. What are the legal rights and protections of such a humanoid? These are to some extent being, being answered by current thinking that revises and expands Turing's definition of a machine to include human emotions. On the other hand, as you're aware, there's a new landmark legislation put into place by the European Parliament just a month ago to regulate the safety of IT in the EU to protect humans alone, to ensure that it does not get into the wrong hands, to ensure that machines do not overtake the world that they inhabit. So science and technology offers a different perspective to the novel's narratorial perspective, which disapproves of Adam's idea of an ocean of thought, that is, of shared knowledge. Yet, such an idea is clearly the way to the future, for pooling the resources of many to create a single alpha mind, lay behind 
the formatting of the AlphaGo robot, one of whose co-founders, Mustafa Suleiman, has said, technological change arises from the collective creative consciousness, for inventions are really held in a private space for long. There is also the belief in current researchers that the programming of thought processes can include emotions, but whether this belongs to the collective creative consciousness is another matter. So we can read against the grain as a text, if we like, and see how AI research is challenging the concept of personhood by reshaping our assumptions about robots having emotions, but also of having collective human capability. In hypothesis, in hypothesizing a robotic future and addressing the question of the moral worth of robots, this requires some, also some reconfiguring of what it means to be human. Thank you.
in this uh, new research where artificial neural networks and everything that AI frame with the motor body and this hyper of architecture. So now the, the presence of Adam and all the parameters that is in place also in the kind of sentient being that he's turned into. Despite that, we find a kind of folly in that is I find an AP, AP phenomenon in terms of he is perfectly capable of doing or feeling everything that a man or a person is able to. But despite the fact he is Hannah at the end of the talk, right? So why so I mean this praise of folly kind of thing that we had? Despite being perfectly capable is not accepted. So he's the perfect uh, counterpart of the rule of brain. But he is supposed to be a person that every person should be like, mm. despite the fact he is having alone. So it talks a lot about our society, it makes a lack of honor, right? What's the thought on that? So, what is your question? The question is what's the thought on that? I mean, the present stage, the AI is not accepted, of course, but this hammering. The hammering is just a, a short form way of killing him, yeah. Yes. And uh, instead of uh, using the kill switch, Yes, much more dramatic and it, an, an act of violence. In fact, a murder. Yes, but, exactly. but because he's a machine, it's not at all that. And Charlie's never convicted of any crime. Gets away. Um, but I, I think the um, the reason for the anger is that Adam is taking on too much control over the life of his owner, and there is no negotiation left. Um, no negotiating goodwill left in the owner because he feels that he's been robbed of his money. He, that he believes he has, yes. Whereas the machine feels he's only acted um, appropriately, yeah. but he's acted unilaterally. So he is his slave and he's given away the money, which is a grey area because it's not really his money. He didn't earn it, but it was, it was uh, within the domestic domain. And so um, that seemed to be a betrayal to Charlie. And that was um, a step too far, and he couldn't um, step back from it. Finally, on the other side, in the meantime, heartily thank.